go for it.
Well, good morning, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church on this beautiful day. It feels like the first day of fall, but we've been in fall for a couple of weeks. Uh, just a few announcements before we begin worship today. Uh, we will have Bible study this week, uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m. in Annex, and we also will be planning to live stream that on our church Facebook page. And um, hope that everyone can join in. On Wednesday, we'll be looking at a passage from Hosea talking about Jesus' marriage. So, if that's of any interest to you, tune in. Now, our, our call to worship is found in Psalm 100. So, let us be called to worship with these words. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him, and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. Let's worship our God as we stand and sing His praise. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the 
wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that they should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. The Lord has blessed us with the gift of family. He's given us many other blessings as well. And so we turn in our hymnals to selection 55. Praising God for the beauty of the earth, the glory of the skies, for the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, and so many other things. We'll sing all five stanzas of hymn number 55, and let us stand to sing. Jesus Christ. 
Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
kind of intimacy with Him, to come into the very garden of God, all we have to do is pray. And God is with us. And we are with Him. So with that confidence, the confidence of the welcome of the children of God, let us pray. Our Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you have made us part of the great family of faith. We thank you for all the congregations that make up the Presbytery of the Gulf South. And we thank you especially for our church planters, for those who are planting new congregations. We ask the Lord for your blessing to be upon Brett Becker, Christian Kreider, Ben Cunningham, and Nathan Cotton today. We pray that you would, through their ministries, draw many to yourself who have drifted away from the church. Lord, we pray that you would accomplish that wondrous work through all the congregations of our Presbytery, all the congregations in Fort Gibson and Clayton County and all over the whole state of Mississippi. Lord, we ask that you would bless and, and encourage those who have become disenchanted with the church, perhaps because of the example that many of us have set. Lord, we pray that you would draw to yourself those who feel isolated, perhaps because of COVID, perhaps because they have been hurt by someone, and they've withdrawn into themselves. Lord, we pray for those who feel lonely, for those who feel left out, for those who suffer with depression or discouragement. Lord, we ask that you would comfort them. We ask that you would encourage them. And we ask that you would help us to be part of the answer to these prayers. That you would give us the love and the courage to reach out to those who are hurting, to those who are lonely, to those who are isolated. To reach out even to those that we're not sure will reach back. And we pray especially, Lord, for our families. Because there are many of us who have family members from whom we have become estranged. We ask the Lord that you would help us to reach out to them. Help us to show the unconditional, self-sacrificial love of Christ. The same love you have shown to us. For we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, 
and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer aloud, little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them, on the children, and departed thence. That is God's word. Those are the words of Christ. So is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Is it lawful for people to get a divorce? That is the question Jesus was asked. And according to the Jewish tradition of the time, divorce was allowed. However, there was quite a bit of controversy about when it was legitimate. And that is the argument into which the Pharisees were trying to draw Jesus. Now, the Old Testament passage from which the Pharisees quote in verse 7 allows divorce. You can read it in Deuteronomy chapter 24, and this is what it says. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then the former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. That's what the law of Moses says about divorce. And as we can see, the law is quite clear about the restriction on remarrying someone in this very particular, frankly, rather convoluted situation. But the law does not, in fact, explain the circumstances in which divorce is allowed in the first place. What is this indecency which a woman can commit which would allow her first husband to put her away? That was the question that the Pharisees brought to Jesus. They wanted him to pick sides. Some of the rabbis of their day took a very narrow view, saying divorce could only be allowed in cases of adultery. Others took a more expansive view. They said that a man could divorce his wife if she served him overcooked food or if she talked too loudly in the house. Now, we modern Americans might find this sort of discussion more than a little old-fashioned. After all, with the explosion of no-fault divorce laws as far ago as the late 1960s, we have come to expect that marriage vows can be broken for any reason or for no good reason at all. In fact, legal marriage has become the one simple contract that either party can break at will without suffering any consequences whatever. It's not at all unusual, for example, for a woman to walk out on her husband regardless of his desire to preserve their marriage, taking the children and half of his earnings in the bargain, and there's very little he can say about it, and there's no penalty she has for breaking the contract. And unfortunately, the church has all too often gone right along with the broader culture and is undermining marriage. Very seldom do ruling or teaching elders ever try to hold anyone accountable 
to his or her vows, much less to investigate whether a divorce is legitimate. Because everyone knows exactly what would happen if such an, if, if such an attempt at church discipline were to be tried. The church member would simply go down the street to another congregation which would welcome him or her with open arms. Now, living as we do in the bubble of the Bible Belt, I know many of us were shocked and dismayed when the Supreme Court forced the states to recognize same-sex marriage. But given the current state of marriage in our country, should we not have seen this coming? Both church and state have long since redefined marriage as merely serial monogamy. By rule and by example, we have established that you can marry as many different people as you like, but only one at a time. Both church and state have thus come to embrace not a biblical, but a romantic idea of marriage. That marriage simply exists for the emotional fulfillment of the couple involved. And thus, marriage is only valid as long as both people continue to be happy. So, if that's true, then why can't people define happiness however they choose? If a man happens to be happy with another man, if a woman happens to be happy with another woman, who's to question that? It's happiness that's the point, right? So yes, the question of marriage, the question of how permanent marriage is, the question of what marriage really means, well, it is still very much with us. So how did Jesus respond to the question in his day? Let's first note what he did not do. He did not get down into the weeds. He did not really pick a side in the current debate about when divorce was allowed and when it was not and what was the threshold for allowing it. In fact, he didn't really go into any of the details about any of the other ways that self-centered or, as Jesus put it, hard-hearted human beings fail to achieve God's design for marriage. Instead of condemning all the wrong ways to engage in human intimacy, he simply focuses on what is right. Instead of condemning each and every way that human beings fail to hit the target of marriage, Jesus instead tries to paint that target for us more clearly. Okay, so what does that target look like? Well, to answer that question, Jesus goes, all the way back to the beginning. All the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 to be precise. When he points out that God's initial plan was to make human beings in the image of God, both male and female. That's the foundation. This radical notion of equality. This fact that men and women are of equal worth in God's eyes equal bearers of the divine image. That is the foundation of everything else Jesus has to teach us, everything else the Bible has to teach us on how men and women are supposed to relate to one another. And it stands in stark contrast to many other philosophies and religions of the day. So how then are male and female people supposed to display this image of God that we all bear, at least in part by engaging in the same sort of life-giving creativity that God displayed when he made Adam and Eve. For what did God tell that first couple? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In other words, human sexual activity and the children that so often result from it is a good part of God's perfect plan for us. So before we go on, we have to be perfectly clear about this point. No matter what the so-called progressives may say, no matter what the romantic devotees of the sexual revolution may believe, 
The Christian faith is not, in fact, rooted in some patriarchal subjugation of women. The Christian faith is not somehow sexually repressed. It doesn't somehow deny the joy and fulfillment of human intimacy. No. The Bible teaches that the equality of the sexes, the importance of intimacy, and the bearing of children are woven into the very fabric of God's creation, a creation that God said was very good. Ah, but how are these ideals to be achieved? How are we to uphold the equality of male and female in relation to one another? How are we to pursue true intimacy with one another? How are we to bring up children in the proper way? The answer to all of these questions, as Jesus says in verses 5 and 6, is Christian marriage. And once again, he quotes from Genesis, this time from chapter 2 and verse 24. Again, a time before sin had even entered the world. Jesus quotes from Genesis 2, 24 to make the point that God's target, God's original design <coughs> for marriage was for one man and one woman to leave the families in which they grew up and to join themselves together in the intimate union of body and spirit, a union that is so radical, so complete, they can be said to be one flesh. Oh, and how long does Jesus say such a union should last? That was the question the Pharisees really wanted to know. How long? Notice Jesus' point of emphasis in verse 6. They aren't even two different individuals anymore. They're one flesh. To divide the marital union would thus be tantamount to cutting someone in two. And many who have been through divorce have borne sad witness that this is, in fact, how it feels. And just to make sure there's no misunderstanding on this point, Jesus adds a phrase that is repeated at most weddings, a phrase I have stood at this spot and repeated more times than I can count, whether anybody's really listening or not, and it is this. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. There it is. That's God's plan. God's plan for human intimacy. That's the target which all Christian marriages should strive to hit. Sexual relations should only take place between one man and one woman joined together in the security of an intimate union for a lifetime. So any Christian that teaches or tries to live by that standard, not being harsh, not being judgmental, not being a bigot. We're just repeating what Jesus himself said. We're just saying what God said from the dawn of time. You know, it doesn't really matter how we simple human beings might miss that target. It doesn't matter if people want to get married on the Elizabeth Taylor plan. Eight husbands, seven husbands, eight times. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if two men or two women want to marry each other. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if two women want to marry one man or two men want to marry one woman. Just wait, that's coming. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if someone feels like sleeping around with all sorts of people either before or during this marriage. It doesn't matter how sincerely those feelings may be. In the face of all these and many other sins, our job as Christians is simply to do what Jesus did. To hold up God's target clearly and consistently and try to hit it and try to encourage other people to hit it. That's our job. But the next story in Matthew's Gospel, the story we find in verses 13 through 15, reminds us of how we should hold up that target. We should hold up that target not in pride, 
Not in some sort of self-righteousness. No. We should hold up that target and point to it with the greatest of humility. The greatest of humility. You see, Jesus was pointing out that just as his disciples had no business looking down on children, and children were considered to be the least important, weakest people in society, so we had no business looking down on anyone who fails to hit God's target of holiness in any way. Instead, we need to see ourselves as those children. We need to be honest about our weakness. We need to be honest about the sin that remains in all of our hearts. For don't we all continue to struggle with selfishness? Deep down, don't we want other people to please us? Don't we all have sincere and earnest desires for certain things that are not holy or not healthy in some way? What did Jesus tell us in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, anyone who even looks at someone else in a lustful manner has committed adultery in his heart. Have any of us even come close to meeting that high standard? No. The sad fact is none of us have any room to sit in judgment on anyone else. Instead, we all need to keep Jesus' warning in verse 14. It's only those who practice true humility. It's only those who consider themselves to be weak and insignificant, like the children were seen to be in those days. Those are the people who enter the kingdom of heaven, not the proud and the self-righteous and those who look down on others. But this need for humility also gives us a clue as to how we can strive to hit that target of Christian marriage, or at least how we can get closer to it. For doesn't Paul tell us basically the same thing in Ephesians chapter 5? Doesn't he tell us that husbands and wives should be subject to one another, should submit to one another. And what is mutual subjection? What is considering someone else's needs to be more important than my desires? What is that if it's not an expression of humility? Of course, Paul says husbands and wives should express this mutual subjection in slightly different ways. He says that a husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. A husband is therefore to give up everything he is and everything he has for his wife. His only desire is for her holiness. And a wife, Paul says, is to respond to this sort of godly, self-sacrificial leadership with respect, treating her husband as the head of the family, even as Christ is the head of the church. That's not going to be easy for either husbands or wives, is it? Radical humility isn't easy for anyone in any relationship. And that's part of the reason why hitting God's target for marriage is so tough. So it's no wonder that the disciples came to the conclusion they reached in verse 10. Maybe it's better, they said, if some folks don't get married at all. And notice in verses 11 and 12 that Jesus does not disagree with them. Instead, he points out that some people do, in fact, choose to remain unmarried for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So, when we put everything that Jesus and Paul have said, have said together, the clear implication is that marriage is only for those who are willing to surrender themselves, who are willing to give themselves completely to their spouses in a permanent and self-sacrificial way. Those who aren't ready or willing to make that kind of humble, lifelong commitment. Those who instead cling to a romantic notion that marriage is about personal happiness or self-fulfillment, those people should stay away from the altar. So yes, Jesus' teaching on children immediately follows his teaching on marriage to underscore the need for husbands and wives to humble themselves before each other. But I wonder, I 
wonder if there's not another reason for Jesus putting these two stories together. I wonder if there's not another reason that Jesus mentions children at this point. Maybe he wants to remind us of the great need that children have for their parents' marriages to be healthy. For however heartbreaking it is for a couple when their dreams of wedded bliss come crashing down, any failure to hit God's target for marriage has an equally devastating impact on the children. Even the secular sociologists recognize this, that children from broken homes are not only at greater risk of all kinds of academic and behavioral difficulties, we, and I say we, admittedly, we also have a hard time forming healthy, long-lasting relationships. And our parents' divorce can affect our spiritual lives as well. In fact, both from personal experience and from working for 17 years at Chamberlain Hunt with so many kids from so many broken homes, I have found this to be true. A child whose human father fails to keep his promises, that child will have a harder time trusting his heavenly father to be faithful to his promises. A child who feels abandoned, a child who feels rejected by either or both of his parents will have a hard time believing that God wants to touch him and bless him the way Jesus touched and blessed the children in verses 13 and 15. And so, yes, we should acknowledge God's target for marriage. We should hold that target up with humility and understanding. But one of the main reasons we should try to hit that target is not just so that our marriages will be happier and not just so that more children will be born. No, we should encourage couples to live together according to God's plan so that their children will not be hindered from coming to Christ. So that their children will not become suspicious, callous, cynical, hardened. So that the good news of Christ's sacrifice for those children will make no sense. Or to put it more positively, as children see their parents giving themselves completely to each other, as children see their parents making sacrifices for each other because they love each other, the idea of Jesus making such a sacrifice for sinners like us because he loves us will not seem so strange. In other words, Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. One of the ways we can do that, one of the best ways we can encourage children to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus is not just to explain what God's target for marriage is, but to live out Jesus' life of self-denying, self-sacrificial love in marriage as well as in other human relationships. Not allowing anyone or anything to put asunder what God has joined together. And come to think of it, that might just be the best way to reach out to those who disagree with us on the definition of marriage as well. Maybe they don't need to hear about it. Maybe they need to see it. Maybe they need to see Christian husbands and wives loving each other the way Christ loves the church. So, will we continue down the proud and selfish path the romantics have forged for us, a path that, quite frankly, has led to so much of the cultural chaos in our world today? Or will we listen to Paul? Will we listen to Jesus? Will we follow the one who went so far as to die for his bride, a bride who was unfaithful to him? Will we humble ourselves before one another so that we and our children might truly be blessed?
Let's celebrate the blessing that God gives to all those who seek his will in the family of life as we turn in our hymnals to selection 531. Happy the home where God is there. We'll sing all four stanzas of hymn 531 and let us stand to sing. Thank you. 